fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Third on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Dave Martino. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you, Al? <laughs> <laughs> well, back from my mouth surgery, and I'm a little sore. And yep. uh, yeah, you know, got a headache, but uh, all to be expected. The things you have to do, you know. That's right. It's it certainly was easier to set my clocks ahead than to, <laughs> to get, get the mouth worked on. But, you know, I but, guess I you know, At least you'll be feeling better soon, you know. Yeah, yes, I, I'm sure next week. <laughs> next sometime, week. Sometime, maybe. A month from now. Yeah, if I can get there. I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy, you know. Can't win. And you, your your movie won Best uh, Picture. Your actor won Best Actor. Oh, oh you're talking about that Oppenheimer. Yeah, the Oscar. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. you like that actor, too, right? So Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Big fan. Oh, well, there you go. Killian Murphy, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. Came, came a long way. You know, yeah. from Oh, definitely. Uh, so that's good. That's good. It's always ha- nice to have a, an actor you like to get, get accomplishments. Absolutely. You know, because quite a few of them don't. Yeah, that's go. true. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. We're going into writing today, and it's a historical fiction. And we've got a Canadian author, and her book's Conflagration. Of course, I... Probably screwed that up with my mouth. And it's Donnelly Moulton. Thank you for being here, Donnelly. Oh, look, thank you for having me. So, so Donnelly, um, before we get into the details of the book, what got you into writing a historical piece in, in, in such detail and putting it in a book? What, what drew you to this story? You know, I would love to have a fabulous anecdote for you, but the reality is that this was not my idea. This was my publisher's idea. My publisher is BWL Publishing out of Alberta, Canada, and they have a series of historical mysteries that span the country. So for every province and territory in Canada, they are writing a historical mystery. Um, She, my publisher, unexpectedly lost her Quebec writer and needed someone to step in and asked if I would be willing to do that. And I said, absolutely. And she said, then here's the story. And it was a story that was, I must admit, brand new to me. What drew you into the story? What was it about the story that made you actually want to put it into a book? There's a couple of interesting things. Um, The first thing was that this story revolves around the trial of Marie-Joseph Angelique, who was an enslaved black woman accused of arson. She was specifically accused of setting the lower town of Montreal on fire, and it was a huge fire that wiped out the entire merchant quarter. So it was a big story. And today, interestingly enough, there is a plaque in Old Montreal um, to Marie Joseph Angelique. So there are living tendrils of this story around today. It was also a story that I had not heard of, and that kind of surprised me because you grow up, you go to school, you take history classes, you get to cover Canadian history, you cover what goes on in the country. And I'm thinking, how did I not know about this, um, this specifically, um, because it is a well-documented story in many regards, but how also did I not know about this in the context of slavery in my country? Well, did you find it difficult to take um, basically you know, this prompt from the editor and then turn it into a, uh, you know, a fictional novel? Did the, did the story come easily for you? The facts came easily because um, this was a court case, and these are well documented. The Montreal Archives has, in French, and, and several websites have translated into English these documents. So access to that material um, was easy. 
what was less easy for me as a writer, my background is in journalism. So my first mystery book is called Hung Out to Die, and it involves a 100% fictional character. I can have him do, say, eat, drive anything my little heart desires. So this was a little bit scary in the sense that you don't want to make a mistake. You know, at one point I have my fictional character getting up in the morning and drinking a cup of coffee, and I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, did they have coffee in 1734? So that pressure to be accurate in terms of the non-fictional elements of the book was a little bit intimidating. But once you get into it, it really becomes a question of, did she do it? Is she guilty? And you get all of these details and all of these court transcripts and all of these witness depositions, and you're, you know, you're bouncing back and forth, and you're trying to, to figure out if this was um, someone who did, in fact, commit arson or someone, in fact, who was very, very innocent. Yeah, and that happened to me. You know, one of the publishers brought up, a, uh, they wanted me to write a trafficking book years back. And I was kind of, mm, I don't know. And then I started doing the stories on it. And, yeah, it draws you in slowly, you know, and then you start learning things and it becomes interesting and it turns into a book. And that thought, I must admit, goes through my mind as I'm as I'm sitting there and I'm starting and I'm thinking, oh, my heavens, this isn't going to be more than 5,000 words. And then you hit 5,000 words and you think, well, maybe I can get three chapters out of it. And then all of a sudden you realize you're 200 pages in and still going. You discover a lot. Well, it's, it's really an, an interesting um, area. So they've actually got a plaque up there for Angelique. Was she celebrated then since all of this, like recently? Like Why, why did they put a plaque up? I think there are a number of factors, not that I would ever speak for the Quebec government, but I think there are a number of factors at play. And I think one of the factors is recognition that as a country, Canada had slavery. It's not something we often say out loud, and it's not something we talk about. But I think in recognition of, of that um, and what happened to Angelique, that's part of why the plaque went up. I also think that in 1734, for example, rumor was a valid enough reason to arrest someone, to put them on trial, and to convict them. So when you read the trial of Angelique, you will read a lot of neighbors, um, friends, other servants in the house who will say, well, she never liked our mistress, or well, she wasn't very nice, or she was a nasty person, or I bet she would do this. Of course, wouldn't stand a chance today. And so there is a lot of recognition that despite the length of the trial, which went on for many weeks, and despite the number of witnesses, there were roughly 24, much of this was supposition or circumstantial, circumstantial there you go, um, and pointing the finger. And so I think that in recognition of that, the Quebec government probably um, let's acknowledge that this was a time in our history um, where we may not have done things as we would like to have had them done. So what exactly is the basic premise? Like what what happened to Angelique and what did she do and and what's the basic theme throughout the book? It's a fascinating um, character, real life character. Um, my sense of, of um, being enslaved is that one is deferential. Um, that is definitely not Angelique. Angelique was outspoken. She was fierce. She was um, brave. She said and called her mistress um, many names and very nasty things and threatened her. And in fact, it got to the point where her mistress was going to sell her. And this is, is one of the pivotal points, I think, um, that maybe Angelique had nothing to lose at this point. Um, so she had tried running away once. Um, she had been unsuccessful in that. She and her, her lover um, were caught and returned. So you have this outspoken um, woman um, who many people are afraid of, including um, her mistress. And then you have this fire that sweeps through the entire lower town. And even before the fire was out, the town crier was going through the streets proclaiming that the guilty party was Angelique. So there's a lot, I think, about her story that is, one, unique to her, but also um, very, very specific to the time and the way we thought at that time and how people were convicted at that time. So do you think she was wrongly blamed for this just because of maybe who she was and what she was about? 
there, there's a there's a couple of things at play. Um, Angelique had a lover, and she had a white lover, and she and that um, man, Claude Thibault, ran away. They were caught, and they were returned, and there was some thinking that perhaps one of the reasons they were caught as quickly as they were is because a, a white man traveling with a black woman back then would have been very um, noticeable. After the fire, um, he he disappeared. He escaped. He went somewhere never to be found or seen again. Under New France law at that time, it was believed that women weren't smart enough, bright enough, manipulative enough to have come up with a crime like arson. So they had to be under the influence of a man. And so that man in Angelique's case would have been Claude Thibault. She never gave him up. So there is some question as to whether they started the fire together, whether he started the fire, whether neither of them started the fire, but they were easy um, scapegoats. So there were there's there's a lot of tendrils to the story other than it being simply a fire started, the town burned, and someone was guilty. So and this is in um, 1730s in that area in Montreal. Was she born there or was she brought over from another country? She was born in Portugal. It's not clear whether she was born into slavery or she was subsequently sold, but the first records and the court documents indicate that as a teenager, she was sold to a, um, a gentleman from Holland, a Dutch gentleman. He, in turn, brought her to New England. And from New England, she was sold to her um, owner in Montreal, um, de Francheville. And so how did she meet up with Claude Thibault? And did he, um, what was his sort of position there? Was, was he uh, popular? Was he working? What, what was it about him? He has an interesting backstory. He, um, neither he nor Angelique liked New France. Angelique didn't like any people who were French. She, she was quite content if they all burned. Um, he, in turn, um, liked the people from France, which is where he was from, but he didn't like the people in New France. He had been convicted in France of selling salt, apparently a very um, expensive, valued commodity, and he had the choice of going to jail or being um, taken over to Canada, to New France, where he would work. And he was in the army in New France. When he got out of the army, as happened to many of um, the ex-army people, they went to work as indentured servants. So he became an indentured servant in the same household as Angelique. And that is how they met. That is interesting. I didn't even realize they did that. I'm I'm really out of touch here. Um, what what do what is this and the research of the book and putting going through all of this stuff? How do you think that's changed you? Oh, that's a great question, and there's no easy answer because, as you know, the research kind of takes place over many months and weeks, and and even as you're writing the book. So there's there are those aha moments where you go, oh, my God, I didn't know that. Oh, that can't be right. Oh, could that really have happened? But then there's just this discomfort that kind of settles in. And I think it settles in because this is my history in my country, and I'm not sure if there was anything right about what happened, or I'm not, I can understand, you know, certain situations are rising, and I can see how people would feel a certain way or not feel a certain way, but you're thinking... It's just such a distinct world from the one we live in today. And so much of what we take for granted today as being right was turned on its head in 1734. And how much injustice occurred as a result is, you know, very difficult to say, but I'm sure it's extensive. In your research, did you find any other suspects for, for the fire, or um, were they not looking for anybody else? I think that the, the 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 judge who led um the the trial he interviewed something like 24 witnesses he had several of them come back he had angelique in um to the courtroom three times i believe and it was many weeks um for the trial which on the surface seems very diligent because as i said evidence was not necessary to convict anybody and the witnesses were overwhelmingly against um 
Angelique. So the work that went into the trial, on the surface at least, indicates that he wanted to be sure he was doing his due diligence and that he had left no, tone, no stone unturned. And that's, that's where my fictional character comes in. In, in recognition of that um, potential reality, I've created this um, special rapporteur who is working off on the side to make sure that every piece of evidence, every document could be um, collected. So that leads you to in, to think, well, you know, while most of this evidence, most of this testimony is circumspect and not necessarily trustworthy, there are one or two things that point to Angelique, and she was certainly very angry. Some of the documentaries, some of the things that have been written about her point to um, another enslaved woman, this time an indigenous woman, who lived in the house attached to the one that Angelique lived in. And there is some uh, suspicion that she may have set the fire, perhaps accidentally. You know, I wonder, um, I, I also see in her, she at first, she of course denied doing it. But this was the time where they could actually beat or torture her kind of into confessing. You know, this was okay back then. So that's what they actually did with her, didn't they? They did. They, there is a form of torture called brodekins, and it, um, it's not a pleasant topic. It involves taking um, the legs of an individual and encasing them in basically a wooden cask, and then you drive wedges of wood between the wood and cask and the person's body. And something has to break. And what breaks is not the wood, it's bone. And so they did um, torture Angelique, and they tortured her for two reasons. This is, this is the court's view on these things. Torture was allowed in more serious crimes because, one, it could um, yield a confession, as it did in this case, very quickly. The other thing is that it can help to point the finger to accomplices. But despite the torture, Angelique never gave up um, Claude Thibault. Where do you think happened to him? Like, where, do you, where did he go? Like, what, why did he disappear? That's a great question. And there's kind of two things that, that swirl around in my mind when I think about him. First of all, it can't have been easy for a white indentured servant to have an ongoing relationship with an enslaved black woman. And they ran away together, and they obviously planned the running away because they had some money saved and they had some food and things like this. So that leads me to think that maybe there were feelings here. Maybe they cared for one another. Maybe they were looking out for one another. But as I said earlier, while the fire still blazed, or as it was coming to its, its last few little flames, the town crier was already accusing Angelique of having said it. So Claude Thibault would have known right away that they were both in trouble. And I would imagine that he would make as quick an exit as he possibly could. Well, I, you know, you, you always kind of wonder whatever happened and stuff like that. Well, so she did any people die in this fire or was it just damage? I see a hospital and, and that burn. So were people injured? Amazingly, um, no real injuries to speak of and no deaths. 46 buildings, including the, the convent and the hospital, burned to the ground. I mean, the whole lower town was, was, it, it was wiped out. And this was the merchant's quarter. So what that meant was, for example, in the house where Angelique would have lived, the, the de Francheville house, that would have been a house that was a home for a family where you had dinners, where you slept, where you, um, you know, enjoyed one another's company, but it was also the business. So it was the place where furs were kept and records of sales were kept and business was conducted. So within, I believe it was 24 hours of the fire, merchants started to line up at the courthouse to, um, bring forward their inventory of what they had lost in terms of their business and their personal possessions, um, looking for the king in France to now reimburse them for um, the money that they were out. And so what happened with Angelique then? How did it end up? Angelique was convicted of arson, and she was 
um, by the the um, judge and, and court in Montreal, she was sentenced to die. She was sentenced to be hanged and to be burned and to have um, her hands um, cut off. Um, at that time, there was an appeal process. There was an appeal court in Quebec City. Um, Angelique had to travel by canoe um, to Quebec City, um, where the appeal court looked at the evidence, and they agreed with the verdict, but they changed the punishment. They did not have her hands cut off, and um, they made it a little less brutal um, than what the court in Montreal did. So she was eventually put in a white cloth with a um, uh, word across the front of the cloth that said arsonist in French, and she was wheeled through the lower town of Montreal. Uh, they stopped at the cathedral because um, any enslaved individual had to be converted to Catholicism. She was put in the carried in. She could no longer walk. She was carried in to the, the church, and then when she came out, she was moved into the center of town where she uh, was hanged and subsequently burned. A whole lot of drama over this. So how, what was the reaction within the city? Did they all support the hanging and really believe she was guilty, or was there any that sort of supported her? You know, interestingly, because you asked earlier, you know, how has this kind of changed me or my thought processes? And one of the things that you pick up on when you start to read some of the testimony from witnesses is this real sense of anger that this has happened, right? And that somebody has to pay. And I kind of fast forward almost 300 years, we've certainly experienced that. When then there's, when there's been a horrific crime and we want to point the finger of blame quickly, we want someone to be held accountable for this, we want someone to pay. And there was that real sense when I was reading about Angelique that the, the, the town said they, they moved instantly from zero. Someone did this to 100%. It was Angelique. And um, her death was more applauded than anything else. People felt she was guilty, and the punishment for her crime was what the court had ordered, and they were fine with that. What did you like writing better? Because you've written fictional characters, and that's a whole different ballgame than writing some characters that are alive. But you've also got fictional characters in this book. What do you? What process do you like better, the fictional or non-fictional characters? Well, that that's tough because I like the best of both, and would like to get rid of the stuff that drives me nuts. There's a a safety net in creating my own characters. I don't have to worry whether you know their shirt was cotton or whether their shirt was silk. It could have been either. I can't be wrong, right? Um, but I don't learn necessarily as much as I did doing the historical fiction, because as I, I noted earlier, it isn't even just about making sure that the information about the trial was correct. But at one point, I have my character putting boots on, and you think, oh, did they wear boots back then, and what were they made out of, and would he have been able to afford them, because he was only a court clerk. So you, you get thrown into a learning experience you wouldn't otherwise get thrown into. So I like the best of both worlds. That said, I will probably lean, I am leaning back to non-historical fiction. When you wrote this novel, it looks like you wrote it in first person um, from her perspective. Why did you cho choose that point of view instead of, say, third person? Yeah, so the, so the, it's actually first person from the point of view of my main character who's fictional. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that, and but you're raising an important point. I can't speak for Angelique. I don't know what she thought. I don't know what she said. So, in keeping with the need for accuracy, the only time I quote Angelique is if there's a court document that says Angelique said this. Other than that, it is my character talking about the situation, surmising, talking to other people about the situation, doing his job, and and in the process of doing his job coming to, up against real and unreal um, characters who are providing him with insight. You know, one of the things I notice different about fiction to nonfiction is the, with nonfiction, fiction, you can't really choose the outcome, you know, whereas in fiction you can actually make sure something right happens. <laughs> There's a little bit of justice at least. I don't know about you, but I, I think that's a big difference. Absolutely. The 
in the case of Angelique, I could not make her innocent. I could not say in my book, you know, that my character sweeps in at the last minute and finds the crucial piece of evidence that exonerates her. I couldn't do that because in reality she was found guilty and she, she did die as a result of being found guilty. So when I started the book, I knew what the outcome would be and that I couldn't change it. The only wiggle room that I had was... Was she innocent or was she guilty? Yeah, you can't have the uh, the hero. The, the cavalry can't come in and save the day at the end, right? There's no, you know, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, what do you think that was most surprising that you learned about the 1730s and in that era around Canada, Montreal at the time? In fact, what I'm, what I'm doing now when I do readings about the book is I've created this little quiz. There's 10 little questions and they all deal with what justice looked like in 1734. And it was very surprising to me some of the things, for example, no lawyers are allowed in the courtroom during Angelique or anybody else's trial. Lawyers were banned in New France and in France from taking part in the justice system. So there are those kind of facts that make you go, really, why? And you look into it a bit and you find out some of the logic or illogic that, that goes around it. So there were a lot of aha moments. The biggest issue for me remains today, after having done my research, after having read numerous books about her, after having watched every documentary, every clip I could, I honestly don't know if she is innocent or guilty. It's the question, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, 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 it's like Jack the Ripper. There's going to be no way you find out, mm -hmm. really. Well, so what do you hope the reader gets out of this book. What are you hoping that people take away from the book um, besides entertainment? And I think, and I say that at the front of the book, that that I hope that um, as readers generally and as Canadians specifically, we begin to understand a little bit more about the history of humanity or inhumanity and that we can carry that awareness forward with us. Because as many people have pointed out, in some ways, Angelique's guilt or innocence is almost irrelevant. Given the life she was forced to lead, who wouldn't be angry? Who wouldn't want to see some sort of justice done? Who wouldn't want to be able to take some control over their own life? So that context becomes vital in terms of understanding um, the situation that occurred in April 1734. Did you, did you actually, did you incorporate some sort of subtext or meaning in underneath the story, or did maybe one came up organically? Is there something under that story that you could consider a, a, a meaning? One of the things that happened that I didn't expect, um, but it goes back to your question about do you prefer fiction or historical fiction, I knew that I had to have a character that somehow would be involved in Angelique's trial. And so I came up with this court reporter who had this special court clerk who had this special assignment. What I didn't expect, and what I didn't expect with my first book, was the characters that somehow seem to emerge. You think they're going to play a small role or a back role, or they're going to be bland. And all of a sudden, for example, my character, Philippe Archambault, begins to have this relationship with the jailer. Well, the jailer becomes this character that I think is absolutely wonderful because he was a surprise to me. So that part of the writing and development offset, to a certain degree, the weight of the story itself. And it did serve to remind me that this is fiction, Donnelly, even though it is based in reality. This is a book that you have created, and ultimately I want people to put it down and say, ooh, glad I read that. You know, your clerk character, uh, Austin Bow, how do you experience your characters then, like your fictional characters? Um, are you the type of writer that hears or sees them or feels them, or it's like watching a movie and you could consider them like a friend? Or how, What's your take on fictional characters like that? My first character, um, after years of saying, because my background, again, is journalism, so after years of saying, I am going to write a book. I am going to write a fictional book. I'm in the bathtub one night with my bubbles and my aromatherapy and my bath bombs, and this idea for a character whose 
a psychopath, but not the evil, killing, violent kind, the kind that gets up every day and becomes a very successful CEO. That kind of came to me when I was in the bathtub. And when I got out of the tub and got all dried off, I actually wrote down the few little snippets. And a couple of weeks later, I said, this is it. You either write the darn book or you just shut up and stop talking about it, right? And so I had that inkling, right? And I built from there. So I don't go into a long backstory or a lot of detail. I start with that kind of nuance. And I did the same thing to a certain extent in conflagration. I said it, it had to be male because nobody female is going to have access to the information um, that he had. He had to be white because no one is going to, to be part of the court system if they're not, uh, with one exception, which was the hangman himself. And he had to be high enough and low enough that he would have access to things. So his occupation came first, then his name came, and then he really came about because um, I, I had him married to someone, and it was his relationship with his wife that all of a sudden started to give him shape and form. It's interesting. The whole process is, yeah. you know. Um, what happens to your characters when, when the book's over? Yes. Sometimes I can be a little mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my main character, um, Philippe Archambault, I have him as I am. I live in Nova Scotia. And um, part of New France was in Nova Scotia in 1734, what we would call um, Lacadie or Acadia. And Acadia is very um, famous for the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. And Longfellow wrote a poem about Evangeline. So and many of them went to New Orleans, so we have connections. So my character starts off um, in Montreal, having lived in Montreal for only a year. He's homesick. He doesn't fit in. His wife is about to have a baby. And you can feel him slightly torn between this world, which is very good to him, and and his home, which is farm country, and which is where he wants to be. So at the end of the book, he says, this is it. I'm done. You know, we're going to have a baby. Um, we're going back to um, Acadia. We'll be safe there. And, of course, in 20 years, he's going to be expelled. Very interesting subject. History is great. Um, well, listen, um, so I guess the book will be available everywhere. Do you have a website and do you do social media? Do you like readers to contact you or interact with you in any of these places? I would love to hear from anyone, anytime. And yes, DonnellyMolton.com. You can get me through there. I'm on Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, now X. So please reach out and let's, there's a lot to discuss about this book and this type of situation. So I'd love to hear, um, from listeners. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. You know, you go back and to a time period and see how, society acted and reacted and what people did and i think it's fascinating so great book um and we'll have all of that up on our website as well so that people can find you and the book so our guest is the author of the book conflagration and it's donnelly moulton thank you for being here thank you for having me thanks donnelly this has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.